Hello everyone and welcome to Catch the Hatch virtual training. We're excited to offer this option, especially considering that everybody's lives are a little bit different um, this June and hoping that um, this, this option will provide either a refresher for those returning um, or all the information you need as a new volunteer to understand the context of the Catch the Hatch project um, and specifics behind the protocols and really what you need to know in order to successfully participate. So with that being said, I wanted to start by introducing myself and the Watershed Center that runs the Catch the Hatch project. My name is Deb Hummel. I am the Watershed Scientist at the Left Hand Watershed Center. Uh, my background is specifically in fisheries, ecology, and management. Uh, so this project is near and dear to me. And um, the Left Hand Watershed Center is a nonprofit organization. We're located just north of the city of Boulder. We were formed in the early 2000s, focused a lot on abandoned mine drainage and water quality issues. After flooding in 2013, the organization um, shifted focus into flood recovery and resilience in our communities. We've implemented a lot of restoration projects. We continue to monitor them um, and evaluate how they're recovering on their trajectory towards resilience to protect our communities and overall environment. We do a lot of stewardship projects with um, Local, local groups um, where we make sure that our project sites have the best chance at maintaining that trajectory towards health and resilience. Um, and we also do a lot of scientific community projects in our community science program. And Catch the Hatch is one of our community science projects. The program overall tries to first get our community involved, learn about the watershed science that we do, what sort of things are important in our area um, for healthy and resilient watersheds to protect us and the environment around us. But it also fills in some uh, necessary scientific data gaps. Catch the Hatch specifically is fills a scientific data gap on mayfly emergence. So not only will you be getting out there and, and experiencing learning about conditions in our creeks, but you're contributing to a knowledge gap in the scientific community. And with that being said, um, the rest of this training will be a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'll be sort of up in the upper hand corner guiding you along through it. Uh, we'll talk about our expectations, um, any of those important logistics to the project and next steps for you, and um, hopefully get you all set to pick up your gear in a couple days and um, get out into the field on your own time and, and start contributing and submitting observations. So thank you again, and let's get started. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, prior to this, you were able to download the volunteer manual uh, shown with the cover sheet um, on this slide. It would be easy if you wanted to follow along on the manual. Um, we're, sort of, we're sort of following, following that outline. Um, and there's a lot more information in that manual if you have more specific details you want to know. But first, we'll go over just specifically um, or an overview of the project. We'll talk more about relevance to science with data collection, um, filling in that knowledge gap, and also just the ecology of mayflies and why they're indicators of watershed health. Um, and then we'll jump into project logistics, how you sign up, how we'll get gear to you, um, protocols, and specifically, and probably import, most importantly, how to identify the pale morning dun, the PMD, um, the, our focus species. First off, um, we want to be clear on what our expectations are for our participants and also what you should expect 
from us. Um, not only do we expect you all to uh, read the materials, ask questions if you have them, but this project really is, you know, the sum is as, as great as its means. And so we all need to, as volunteers, commit to observations. During the project timeline from July 15th to, or June 15th to July 15th, um, the goal is to get an observation at each of the three project sites every day looking for emergence of the pale morning dun. And that's collectively. So if we as an individual can commit to multiple observations once a week, you know, would be great. Um, and obviously, you know, all our schedules aren't puzzle pieced together, so multiple people can go on the same day. Um, but the idea is that we all at least commit to multiple observations. Um, and when we're out there, we expect that you will follow the field protocols, which are pretty lenient uh, when it comes to scientific data collection. You know, the idea is that you're going to walk along the creek, um, sit and observe for a little bit, fish, you know, um, assuming that you'd probably already be looking for um, um, hatches occurring. But we want to make sure that each individual is following the field protocol, entering data, and then um, throughout the project, we're hope, we hope that you will maintain your gear, treat it respectfully, and return it to us at the end. Because it's some pretty cool stuff. We have awesome insect nets, but they are a little pricey. So, you know, we want to make sure that these are maintained from year to year. What you can expect from us is not only communication, um, updates of resources if, if you need any help or have any questions, um, but at the end of all of this, we will follow up with our data assessment, we'll provide you with results so that not only, you know, are you enjoying this experience during the field part of it, but you get, you understand, you know, what, what you collected and the data you submitted is being used for. So I hope you find this um, beneficial and um, useful, use, uh, good use of your time. Um, let's jump into the relevance to science, which um, is really fascinating to me. Um, first off, the mayfly. Um, mayflies typically have four main life stages. Um, that involve both in water and terrestrial life stages. So we begin with an egg stage. Um, if we're starting at the beginning of a mayfly's life, um, eggs usually attach to substrate. Um, mayflies prefer well oxygenated, cold, fast flowing water. So all of these life stages are, um, you know, and, and they're their appearance and um, anatomy is designed to live in that kind of environment. So the eggs are stuck to the rock. When they hatch, they're nymphs or larvae. Um, nymphs can live underwater for multiple years. There is a trigger in water condition and overall water quality that will cue a nymph mayfly to emerge into its adult form. And Currently, the Watershed Center, a lot of our municipalities, a lot of scientists, a lot of people study the nymph phase. It's easy to collect that you can characterize the aquatic community um, as nymphs. Species in the water are really good indicators of water quality. If you have species that are sensitive to um, temperature, oxygen, um, metals, um, pH, so sensitive to acidity, they may or may not exist. Um, these, these larval um, life forms can't just swim upstream or downstream and sort of escape some kind of water quality impairment. So presence or absence in the water is a really good indicator of your water quality conditions. We have a lot of information on this. We study it year after year um, to monitor water quality and watershed health. But what about the adult phase? So 
um, watershed conditions um, sort of cue the nymphs to hatch, whether it be within the first you know, few months of their lives or years of their lives. Um, usually it's temperature and flow um, at the descending limb of the hydrograph. So just after high flows, temperatures are starting to rise a little bit in our creeks, um, flows are decreasing, maybe a nymph figures, hey, it's time to emerge. And the sole purpose of the adult phase is to reproduce. Um, nymphs, on the other hand, have feeding parts, scraping, they're collecting, they're gathering, um, and eating. Um, adults don't have any functional mouth parts. They are specifically there for a matter of a day or two to reproduce and maybe fly upstream to um, distribute the population. So this phase is critical for the population of certain mayfly species to distribute um, and also reproduce to the next generation. And it's really hard to capture this. Scientists don't have a lot of time to get to the creek and, uh, and make these observations. So that's where we come in. Let's collectively monitor these sites and, um, and see when adults are reproducing. Are there certain years, certain conditions that are inhibiting this, um, these hatches or these adult phases? So not only are the nymphs an indicator of water quality and watershed health, but the adult emergence is also an indicator of our watershed conditions if they're appropriate for these species to reproduce. And lastly, these flies are major food resources for our fish. So we can imagine if there's something off with the, the um, cues to emerge and reproduce and keep the population going, we might have sort of a cascade effect on other organisms. Um, so in our area, We've got uh, a lot of research going on um, or monitoring of our nymph phases, and we know where the pale morning dun exists and where a lot of our mayflies exist. We have cold, fast flowing, snow melt driven creeks um, that are favorable for some, some of these mayfly species. And so um, these blue dots here show where we have. Um, samples these um, pale morning done in the stream or we've we and we have data to, to show that so when we were selecting sites for the adult observations we sort of mimicked where they'd exist already in the creek and that's primarily in the transition zone which is outlined by this blue um, hue here. The transition zone is a really dynamic area, so there's a lot of influence on an annual basis, on a weekly basis, you know, rainstorms, snowpack, it's all influencing what conditions are in these areas. So they're sensitive to climate change, variation in snowmelt, um, and so monitoring both the nymph and the adult phases in this area will give us an understanding of how our um, biological communities responding in our creeks to changing conditions from year to year. And so our research questions um, for this project, which we've met with professional um, researchers, academics to design um, what's feasible for a community to, to answer when these questions. And the first two are more of an annual basis, what we can you know, answer ourselves um, and report back to you, you know, after, after a season. The first is, can our community um, identify adult forms of the pale morning done? Um, I forgot to mention there's two forms. There's the emergers that are called um, the sub-imago or sub-adult. Um, and they're basically emerging from the creek surface, flying to a piece of vegetation or substrate, and then they will 
um, shed another layer and metamorphose to a final adult form that's responsible for swarming above the creek and reproducing um, all in that you know day to two day window. So we want to know, can our community do it? And we really think we can. Last year, any time our um, volunteers collected using their nets and identified, they were right. They, they knew how to identify them, um, which is awesome. It's such a valuable resource to have people um, that are already interested in, in their creeks be able to sort of contribute to this effort. Um, so, that's one question we'll continue to ask ourselves. The second is the sampling time frame. At what time of day is it most effective to look for these adults and subadults um, emerging from our creeks? A lot of literature suggests that it's midday, uh, like 10 to 2 um, is like the emergence time where you'll have your subadults really characteristic features, easy to identify, whereas maybe later in the evening it might be a little more difficult. Um, this project allows volunteers to go out at any time, but we were just curious, you know, is does it differentiate? And then our next two questions are sort of long term that we won't be able to answer, you know, in a year, but th that these um, annual efforts will contribute to a larger data set. The one being, do our adult and nymph stages exist at the same time? Um, are we not seeing emergence year after year? And then are we seeing a decline in nymph, um, nymph forms as well? Um, and then the last one, which is the real big one that is really going to be great to have these data available over a longer period of time, is how does the presence of these adults change during peak emergence? Um, in this transition zone over time. So we have at the bottom here our, our first year 2019 catch the hatch chart um, where we have blue in blue here we have days where we observe them. And if you re may remember last year we had a delayed runoff. So within this peak emergence window a lot of our observations were shifted to the later half. That's because flows were not queuing. They, they weren't queued by the temperature and the declining um, flows. They were delayed. So imagine lining this chart up one after the other, year after year, to see where the shifts are. What were the temperatures like? Are they changing? Um, and then flows, are they consistent or are they changing? All right. So. Let's get into some logistics. Um, our website that many of you have probably already visited if you were signing up for this um, session is a great resource. Um, you can access really anything you may need um, that we'll go over today. So let's just quickly run over to our website so I can just show you a few key resources. All right, so from the Left Hand Watershed Center's um, page, we have uh, our Catch the Hatch project, shows a little detail. Um, and then you probably are familiar with our one, two, three steps. The first one, which you've completed, is signing up for a training. Great job. Um, step two is going to be gear delivery and pickup. A lot of you have done that as well, but we'll talk about how to get that done. And then lastly, signing up for observation days, which is all done online. We have our three locations, one on North St. Brain near Button Rock, basically anywhere along that parking lot um, at the Button Rock Preserve. You can travel the creek um, and observe for emergence. Then we have uh, the left hand, uh, left hand creek at Buckingham Park. And again, there's a parking area and it's basically the whole stretch of creek within that park limits. And then lastly, we have Memorial Park in Boulder. Some of you might uh, remember we were toying around with the idea of also including even G Fine. We were excited to include it this year to try and avoid um, having people travel up with um, construction. 
but due to um, some closures with COVID and just looking out for the safety of everybody, we decided we wouldn't pursue that one in this year. So we stuck to our original um, at Memorial Park, which is just up a little ways. Um, and we hope that you'll have time to, to get out there. It's a beautiful area and um, great fishing too. So, um, and we saw a lot of observations last year. So if you're looking for a place to, to see something, head to Memorial Park. Um, all right, so we did trainings. Then the next thing you do is sign up for gear delivery or pickup. We have a few um, local locations uh, in Lyons, Boulder, and Longmont. So you click this button, you decide where um, between, uh, there's a few dates that we're planning, I think July, June 11th to 13th, a Thursday through a Saturday, um, where you can come pick up your gear. Um, these locations are our staff homes. <laughs> so, um, you know, they're going to be residential areas and we're just, just going to try and set things up outside. You can pick up your gear and uh, sign it out and you're good to go. But if you have any questions, um, hopefully we'll be around or close by to, to help you. Um, if you can't make that, schedule a gear delivery or contact me directly and we can arrange something. Um, you can enter that information there. Um, and then lastly, your sign up. So um, you can click one of the creek options. You can go to as many as you want. You can go to Boulder Creek, left hand, same frame, all in the same week, but you'll always have to go through um, this sign up um, that directs you to the sign up page um, that you may have not seen yet because we didn't have you sign up for your training on here. But basically from here, you can select any day within the window and sign up um, for an observation. And the time frame is, you know, any time during the day. Uh, sign up there. Um, you'll see there's three options, like there's three slots for people to fill. If you see somebody that's already um, taken a slot and you are available on a different day, try and take that slot. But if you're not, the more the merrier. Um, you know, sign up for that um, observation day. We'll get two people and that's great. Um, so this, and you can sign up for multiple from this page. So if you just wanted to get everything on Left Hand Creek out of the door, sign up for your a few days, you can do that from this screen. But if you wanted to switch, to Boulder Creek or Button Rock, you'd come back to our project page. The last thing I wanted to point out on our website is this project materials. We have our volunteer manual, which is something that hopefully you've already loaded. Um, we, we sent that out to you directly, but if you lose it on another copy, it's right here. Um, we just have some overview stuff. Some of this is embedded in that volunteer manual. Then we have field stuff. Um, the field protocol, which is from the volunteer manual, but broken out. Um, data sheets, if you need another data sheet. Uh, we have our PMD guide and lookalikes guide, which you'll receive in your gear packet um, or your gear bag. But if you lose it and need another one, you can load it there. And then flow resources. This is just a document where you can click on our local creeks and see what the flows look like right now. Um, so right now, Boulder Creek is running maybe about 375. Um, just interesting to pay attention to if you're curious um, what the flows are. And, um, and then we have anything related to um, technology, our data entry protocol, and also loading Catch the Hatch on sitsci.org, which um, sitsci.org houses our project and our data, is our sort of data management. Um, all our observations are plugged in here. You could view these all. Um, I'm not sure if we ran through, if, if you've signed up yet, but basically you'd want to sign up on sitsci.org before doing any of your data entry um, to contribute your data to the project. Um, and we have, you know, maybe the majority of you already are members, so that's great. You don't have to, you don't have to do that step again. All right. Let's jump back in to oh, signups. 
Um, we have the three three locations. The goal is that collectively there's about 30 of us. So um, collectively, one of us will be at East Creek location on each day. That is, I believe there's 30 days of the project. So we have 90 total days to get out there and we have 30 people. If we all went out, you know, on different days, um, three days during this month window, boom, we'd hit our goal. Um, sign ups. I again go to the project page to sign up. Gear. So before you go out in the field, you need your gear. Um, this year, with with COVID, um, with the COVID situation, we are per, um, again offering the local gear pickup or a delivery option um, within your gear kit. So when you when you show up to grab your gear or you arrange something, you're going to get a bag um, with everything on this slide in it. And in that bag, you have, and I'll make myself a little bigger here. You have uh, an ID guide, laminated. You can take them into the field with you. Um, that shows you <clears throat> PMD characteristics and then lookalikes. Now, because we're located in the Rockies, we have a history of some uh, mining issues that may have um, you know, impaired some of our stream conditions and just because we're so high up, um, our diversity of mayfly species or just species in general, trees, you know, mammals, whatever it might be, is limited because we have limited habitats. So there's really only three main mayfly species you might be run, you may be running into, which makes it easy to sort of distinguish. Um, all right, then we've got our three-piece collapsible net. So in the net, you'll have some instructions on how to fold it, which is important because this helps keep the net um, in top condition. And so we don't have any, um, you know, damaged nets or try to, try to reduce any damaged nets. So basically, this is the head of your net. And it has a wire frame that will um, expand into the body. And this one's soft. Okay, so I just sort of pull it loose and it opens. You have this net, aerial net. This is a pretty sensitive material. So when you're at the creek, try not dragging it on the ground, just sort of keep it collected up with you while you're sort of looking around. Then easily we've got two collapsible um, extensions. This is an improvement since last year. So while our volunteers were able to um, were able to identify the mayflies that they caught correctly, they were having trouble catching them. We've got we've improved by 12 inches. So hopefully you'll be able to have a better grasp <laughs> or um, I guess swing, swoop um, at catching a mayfly that might be emerging up from the creek. So this is your collapsible net. The idea is that you could shove it in your backpack and go on a hike. So if you want to use this for, you know, an adventure hike and you want to catch some butterflies and look at them close up, Take it with you, um, but also don't forget to sign up for my project. So for every hike you go on, or you might want to use this, you have to do two observations at the creek. Um, this is the last important step: is putting the net back to its smaller form. Basically, you're going to fold it into a crisscross, keep going, and then slide. So you have like this figure eight here keep going and slide that top part on the, over the other one. You can then use sort of your net to um, help hold it in. If you'd prefer to also have your rubber band um, to help keep things together, feel free to use that. 
And bam, got it put back. Ready, ready for another compact observation. Um, the last few things you have, which we'll talk about um, later, is the thermometer. Easy to see, hopefully. Um, take a creek temperature, and then some of some uh, observation vials that are filled with 75 to 80% ethanol, which preserves um, specimens. There's also some labels in here um, that you'll uh, use if you do catch a PMD. You'll fill out your label with your name, time, date, what location you're at. You'll fold it, sort of, you don't need to fold it, fold it, but kind of bend it, and you'll slide it through into the vial with your insect. Um, we usually send the insect off, either I will look at them and then we'll contact them with an entomologist at um, CSU. So we want to make sure we have those everything labeled. Um, <clears throat> and if there's another insect you're just curious about, send it to us and we'll get back to you on what it is. We love identifying insects. Um, and last but not least, an awesome sticker. Love your watershed. Put it on your bumper, put it on your net, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and that's your gear. So um, another thing you might have, I think we're going to put also in that bag is some spare data sheets. Um, <clears throat> but as I mentioned, those data sheets are also available online if you have a printer and you can print them. Every time you go out into the field, we want you to record your data first on a data sheet. It's really important to do that. Um, and then our protocols, the volunteer manual, um, that's also available online if you want to review that. All right, so you have your gear, now you're ready. Um, you signed up for a date that works for you. Um, each observation should be at least a half hour in length. And there's two time frames. Remember that research question of which time frame uh, results in the most uh, observations. So there's this 10, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. time frame where you might have emerging subadults, so the ones that are coming from the surface of the water and flying up to reach that piece of substrate to do its final um, molt into the adult form. They have that characteristic pale um, appearance, so they're easy to identify. Um, then we have this 2 p.m. to sundown option, which is perfectly acceptable, but if you have the option of going earlier, we would recommend it. Um, but you might see the subadults still emerging, or you might see adults um, on vegetation or substrate or swarming um, above the creek. And really the main difference between the adult and subadult are the subadult has this pale, um, characteristic kind of reddish yellow hue. When you see it in sunlight, it really does kind of glow yellow. Um, I, we, I've seen them quite a bit um, last year and their wings are a little gray. Um, they have, males have these big yellow eyes um, and the adults are a little darker um, in appearance, they're still reddish yellow, but they are a little more solid, darker, but their wings are clear. Again, the um, adult males will have these big orange eyes. So choose your time frame. When you get there, make sure you have your data sheet and you record the date. Recorder is your name, site name, so Buckingham um, Memorial Park, or button rock. Any comments when you get there, if you want to note something, comments are always helpful. Um, you saw trash on the creek, tell us. Or um, there was no parking, tell us, because that will improve sort of our site selection. Um, or it might be uh, halfway through my observation, a storm rolled through or my observation was cut short for X, Y, Z, whatever you want to tell us um, that's not already sort of included on this data sheet. Um, you'll also record your arrival time right when you get there, weather conditions. Um, believe it or not, not only do creek conditions affect emergence, but atmospheric conditions. So was it clear? Was it storming? Um, was it windy? 
overcast, partly cloudy, rain, um, just select one of those. And then immediately when you get there, take a temperature, take a creek temperature, submerge it in the water for, you know, I think the protocol says five to 10 minutes. These will get you a temperature, you know, at least just do three minutes. Just making sure that the, um, the liquid inside is not changing dramatically. So, you know, pull it down for a few minutes, check it, hold it down a little longer, check it. If it didn't change, that's likely your creek temperature. And that those are in uh, Fahrenheit. And then that's sort of when you can kind of put, put your, that stuff down and maybe just carry your net along with you, um, tuck it into your waders while you're fishing, whatever. Um, and just observe. Um, if you see something emerge, so basically you're looking for, you're looking at the water surface and you're looking for a small insect, hopefully caught maybe by some light or something where you can see it reflect a little bit, just coming, rising up from the surface, sort of in a straight line. So when mayflies emerge, they're just trying to get up. Um, they're not, buzzing around like maybe a bee or some other kind of aphid um, along the, the surface. They're just going up and they're trying to find that substrate or vegetation. Um, so look on the water surface, maybe check some vegetation and substrate. And if you see one, we'll want to know what time that was. Um, you don't need, if you see one, Note the time, check your watch, check your phone, whatever you have. Um, and then maybe you want to grab your net and look for more. You know, usually the first one you see, you might not catch it. <laughs> um, it's not going to be, uh, you want to be sort of in tune. But usually when you see one, you'll see, you'll see others. So sort of just watch that area and, and try and catch it with your net. Once you have it in your net, um, and if you don't end up catching one, but you're seeing mayflies emerge, record that. Record yes, record what time, but really try and catch one to validate your observation. And then on top of that, once you have it in your net, maybe try and take a photo of it in your net if you can. If, if it's um, flying around and getting really agitated, um, maybe you just want to put it in a vial and take a picture of it in there. Um, usually what I do, if I catch one in my net, I will try and work it up to the top. So maybe I caught it and it's like right here. I'm going to try and pinch that area down, keep that cap, and try and encourage it to go down farther, 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 until I have it in a good spot or maybe it's a pocket, a pocket on the side. Just try and create a pocket with it. That'll make it a lot easier to get it into um, one of your vials. Then what you can do is sort of get your vial set up and um, perhaps dip your finger in the liquid in the vial or some water from the creek. Ethanol, just don't like lick and drink it, you'll be fine. Um, but you might wanna dab your finger and have moisture on it because that'll sort of catch the wing. Um, or catch the body part so you can delicately put it into your vial. So maybe you stick your finger into your pocket. Um, try and delicately, once you feel like you have it in your pocket, you can then release, grab your vial, and put it in. Take a photo of it. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention, while you're um, on, upon arrival, when you're recording your, your first observations, take a site photo of a sort of a landscape photo so we can see what the conditions looked like. You know, if it was cloudy, um, what, it, what were the flows looking like? Um, that'll be great. All right. So just a few details on where to look. Um, remember that the nymphs, love fast flowing, well oxygenated ripples. They're clinging to the substrate. Um, so when they're emerging, they're releasing from that substrate. They're floating along the surface probably pretty fast. And then they're emerging from there. Um, so what you'd what from what I found to be successful 
is trying to find one riffle, which is here on um, the left side of the screen, and then two, some slack water by that riffle, usually near the side. So we have this rock in the back here. Maybe I'd post up behind that rock and I just watch the slack water and maybe some of the fast flowing water next to it. Um, because you can imagine maybe, maybe the insect jumps from the rock here. It's flowing down, flowing down, flowing down, finds some slower water, slows down a little bit, and then boom, it emerges up from there. Um, this is actually Buckingham Park. Um, when you get to the parking lot, if you're looking at the creek, you would go left and walk upstream. And there's sort of this bend. Um, and I will say I did see insects emerging while I was there. So um, this is a good spot. It's a nice riffle. Um, let's look at sort of a video of this area. I am looking downstream. We have this riffle here. Um, then we upstream, we've got a pretty fast flowing sort of pool. Probably not going to occur in that curved fast flowing area, or maybe you don't even want to be standing there. However, we have some slack water here. Might be good to stand downstream of that and watch. Again, we have our rock with that slack water, maybe stand on the edge there. Um, and then sort of on the, the edge of the water, you might find some, some slack water to um, hang out and look for emerging insects. So this is the same spot, but we're just looking upstream. This is a really nice slack water area here. So again, we have this really turbid, um, concentrated flow, probably not going to be too easy to see anything um, emerging. Then we have this nice, beautiful, quiet slack water and also some good sunlight. Sunlight's also really helpful to see that emerging um, from there. So those are a couple tips on where to, to see the emerging mayflies. Like I said, you'll see one and then maybe, and then you just gotta wait and watch and for others um, with your net ready. And hopefully with the longer extension, you'll have the ability to sort of, you usually will notice them as they're rising, you know, so you wanna be able to, to catch them. Alrighty, so when you see one, or if you don't see one, um, either answer is, is exactly what we're looking for. So, um, did you see any? No? Awesome. Those observations are equally as important. Um, although maybe feel defeating, we want to know when you didn't see them just as much as we want to know when you did. Remember, you're recording information on um, weather, you're taking a creek temperature. There's so much data you're collecting that if you don't see the emergence, you're still contributing to this project. Um, and seeing it is sort of the gravy on top of it, fun for us, fun for you know the data effort. But if you see one, remember to record the time, try to capture it with the net or try to capture it of following one with a net and take a photo of it. So for example, we've got a photo here of them in their vial, perfect. Um, and then we have a photo of one in the net too. You kind of see that characteristic grayish um, wing that those, the two photos we have here of the up close um, in the vial and in the net are the, uh, the sub-adults. And then last year we also had a volunteer take an awesome photo of actually a spawning event, or sorry, a um, reproductive event um, where the males and females are swarming above the creek. And maybe with the extension, you'll be able to get up there and take a few. Um, and then, okay, so, so that, those are your observations. And when you're getting ready to leave, make sure you record the time. Um, and then any other comments that uh, you wanna mention from your visit. Okay, so now we are going to jump into the PMD identification. Um, what are the key characteristics of the pale morning done? Mayflies, all mayflies, have these scent-like wings. So you have their body and then the wing is projecting from the top. Um, whereas other insects may have 
wings overlapped on top of them, on top of the body, or they're just um, perched up like, uh, sorry, mayflies are the sail. Um, and then you might have wings that are sort of like a tent on top of the, um, of the insect body. So you're always looking for these projected wings that are going up vertically. Um, those are gonna be your mayflies. They are pretty small. Um, they are about a third to a quarter of an inch. So that's like, I don't know, the size without the tail is the size of my pinky uh, nail. So they're pretty small, um, but definitely visible. I mean, we've, I've seen so many of them um, around this time of year. So fear not, you will see them um, if they're emerging. And um, the real key characteristic here, besides the pale reddish yellow appearance, um, to really cue you in is the three um, elongated tails. Most mayflies um, in their adult form in this area, they'll have two, two or three tails. The pale morning den has three. There's only one other species that has three, but they're very distinct from each other. So you'd be able to tell them apart. So always look for the three tails, um, uh, that reddish yellow appearance. They're not going to be brown. There are some other insects, um, some other mayfly adults that, that are just distinctly brown. Um, and then again, we have our, our females and our males. So the males have the big orange eyes as both subadults and adults, um, while the female has smaller eyes, but it'll still have those three tails and it might be yellowish greenish versus the yellowish red. Um, but those three tails, those are gonna cue you in if you're able to catch it. Um, however, if you're seeing it visually, it might be the, the yellowish appearance um, as they're emerging. And the big, the big eyes too, the big orange eyes help. So here are some, some lookalikes. During this emergence window, um, June to July 15th, you might see the blue winged olive. Um, they're grayish blue. They um, have kind of a, uh, a grayish blue uh, wing, so, so similar to the, the emerging pale morning sun. Um, but their bodies are reddish brown or greenish, and they only have the two elongated tails. Similar to them are the red quill, also two elongated tails, and they're dark red brown. So you'll be able to tell right away that they are not that palish blue or uh, pale yellow red appearance. And then this other three tailed uh, mayfly is the green drake, but they are a stout, stocky mayfly that you're not going to confuse the two. Um, they have this olive, olive brownish appearance. Um, and then their three tails are stout little things. Whereas these other two mayflies and the pale morning done on, on this seat, they're sort of elongated bodies and their tails are elongated. So it's just the pale morning done that'll have those three tails. Alrighty, this is sort of the last section here. Um, we've gone through uh, the field stuff, identification, um, now jumping into the data entry side. So the first step here is that everybody needs to register um, on the site.org webpage. You sign up, you use your email, create your own password, you'll get a confirmation, um, and then you can search under projects for Catch the Hatch. When you get to that page and see it, click join, ask to join, and that will send a notification to me to approve you to join the project. Um, it's a private project because we're really trying to make sure we have val validated, trained volunteers. So you'll join um, and you'll be a part of the exclusive Catch the Hatch team. Um, with data entry, step one is always recording it on your data sheet. Um, and taking photos directly to your phone or camera while you're in the field. Um, 
then you have two data options um, that either one, you drive home to your computer and you plug it in on the society.org website, or two, you use the My Watershed app. And the My Watershed app is designed to, to help um, with streamlined data entry and um, allows you to upload things just mobily from your phone. But for the time being, um, we're encouraging anyone from taking those observations in the field, um, you know, basically directly uploading data rather than that data sheet to home session um, approach. Because there are a couple of tweaks that we're actually working out right now, um, and we'll be launching a new, a new version of the app in a few months here. So let's just follow this protocol of always record on your paper data sheet with your pencil, old fashioned, take the photos on your camera or phone, or uh, yeah, camera or phone or camera on your phone, um, and then decide one or the other. And you can do both of these, basically the app, is a mobile version of uploading directly to the website. Um, and you can always, no matter what way you decide to enter your data, you can always edit it on the website on society.org. So if, we, if we're following the website entry, we would um, click the, we would log into society.org with our username and password after we've been approved for the Catch the Hatch project. Um, once, and then you can go into the project itself. You click Add Data, um, and you'd enter information on the data sheet online. And that basically copies or it's, um, mirrors what your data sheet on paper is. Um, you'd also upload your photos here, so you'd need some way of either um, you could you could log into society.org on your phone and upload there and just upload from, from your gallery. Um, or you'd need a way to get your photos to, to your computer to, to attach them. But photos are really important, so please make sure you upload many. There's no limit. Um, upload as many as you want. Okay, then you'd click Submit. And um, you can always review your data. So. Um, you can then find, I didn't include, there's screenshots of everything in your manual, but you can always, if it's your data entry in the view data option, you can um, view or edit your data and then this screen would appear of where you can edit different things. So there's always the option of reviewing your data and if you're like, oops, that one's wrong, you can edit it. Um, if you have questions about that too, you can reach out to me because I also have the ability to um, edit anybody's input submitted data. Okay, lastly, um, we've got our My Watershed app. Um, you'll still need to have created a society.org account. Like I said, the mobile app is just basically uploading up, uh, data entry to the society.org server. So you'd go to your App Store or Google Play and you'd download, you'd search My Watershed, download that, you'd sign in using your credentials from sitsci.org, um, allow access, um, and then you would um, allow, the app will automatically load Catch the Hats if you're already a member. If you're not already a member, you will need to um, allow it to refresh. So it, it will, um, it always uploads, you know, what kind of projects you have, you've gained entry to. Um, because My Watershed stores more projects, you know, somebody might be doing multiple, including Catch the Hash, so you may have a list. Then you would go to your project, um, row here, you, you select Cache the Hatch, and then your data sheet, you might have to click it and select the Cache the Hatch data sheet. Then you'd click Add Observation. There's a main tab, which is where you'd upload your photos. You could click on your file button here and upload them from your camera. Um, you can enter multiple. And you'd enter uh, your date here and any comments. Um, and you'd also select your location from a dropdown. 
then you would click over to the site data tab here enter your data similar to your data sheet similar to the subsite.org all of these are connected um, enter all your um, data points and click save observation you will then be directed back to the project page where you would click my observation. So when you say, when you click submit observation, that's just storing it locally to your phone. You're not uploading it to the, the sitesci.org server yet. So you'd click my observations. You'd see the one you just entered or maybe you have a couple from a couple days. Um, Ideally, you'd be, you'll be entering data within you know, a couple of days of your observation, so you wouldn't have like a month's worth um, waiting to be uploaded. Um, so yeah, make sure you're always uploading within a couple of days after your observation. Um, might be easiest just to do it you know, the day of. You would, so you'd go to your observations, you'd click the one you wanna upload, and you'd click upload, it would say it's uploaded. <laughs> and you could always check and verify on the society.org website. Um, on the iOS, this is the, the Google app, um, or sorry, the Android app version. Um, there's a note here on, um, on the Apple iOS version of the app right now, you have an option to upload all or upload one, um, just for simplicity and, and avoiding any potential um, errors unwanted errors, always just select one at a time and upload one. And with that, that is everything I have for you. And if you have questions, please reach out to me directly. Um, my information should be on, um, on your emails and it's dhummel at watershed.center. Uh, let me know. And I'm really looking forward to having you all. So I guess the next steps for you after this is make sure you sign up for that gear pickup delivery and um, sign up for some observation days. I'll be in touch throughout this whole process, making sure we're trying to collectively get out there to, to all the sites each day. So you'll know where some needs might be. Um, but thank you again, really looking forward to it. And um, I hope you have a lot of fun with this project. And um, I'm sorry we couldn't all be together to sort of kick this off, um, but in, in the future. And um, thank you again, have a good day.